thank you all very much for coming today so that we can be here and to praise God for his goodness and to remember who he is and to remember our dear sister and to love God for all that he has done for us. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for how good you are. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your justice. And God, we thank you so much for the time that you gave us with our dear sister. Lord, there are many things that we will hear today, that we will think about, that will be pointed to about Chris and who she is with you, God. For we know that she is absent from the body, but she is present with you, Lord. And we know that every good thing that we knew and that we saw was a reflection of your love and your mercy. God, as you told us, we are to love you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to love one another so that by this love, people would know that we are your disciples. God, help us to take comfort, to be comforted because we do mourn today. We mourn and we are also jubilant. We exalt you, God, in knowing that we see again another, another evidence of your triumph. The fact that we know that our dear sister is with you is another proof in what you have done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I get the privilege of reading out of my grandmother's Bible this morning. Lamentations 3, verses 20 through 26. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Be 
How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in the house, they will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in, though, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca may make it well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Psalm 84. Sinners gain 
Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor, vouchsafe to me thy grace. My shepherd now receive me, my guardian own me thine. Great blessings thou didst give me, O source of gifts divine. Thy lips have often fed me with words of truth and love. Thy spirit oft have led me to heavenly joys above. was born on the 4th of July in 1953 to Dr. William and Catherine Titcomb. She spent her childhood in St. Joseph, Missouri, where she graduated from Central High School. She moved to Cedar Rapids in 1976, where she and her daughter began attending the Fellowship Christian Center in Cedar Rapids. It was at the Fellowship Christian Center where she met William Randalls, the second love of her life after Jesus Christ. My understanding of their meeting was that they both volunteered to teach a youth Bible study, and they were drawn to each other because of their love for the Word of God. And after approximately six months, they were married on September 6, 1980. After marriage, Bill and Chris started a Bible study on Friday nights at their apartment on Grand Avenue. And this was where I first met them as a young junior high student, invited by my uncle. Chris would play her guitar and lead songs of worship to the Lord, and Bill would bring forth the message 
how many people here were part of that Bible study? Chris taught herself to play guitar in worship while pregnant with Anna. She was playing guitar and leading worship one Wednesday night when her water broke and she had to excuse herself gracefully from the service to have baby Anna. As the Bible study outgrew the Grand Avenue living room, Pastor Larry Johnson from the Open Bible in Cedar Rapids asked Bill to be an itinerant preacher to churches around the Cedar Rapids area that needed a pastor to fill in. And it was shortly after this that Bill and Chris were led to start Believers in Grace Church on November 1st, 1981. The church, just two years ago, had its 40th anniversary. Isn't that a miracle? After outgrowing, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so after outgrowing the church in their living room and then moving to the Cedar Rapids Women's Center on 2nd Avenue, they purchased a home on Prairie Drive Northeast in Cedar Rapids that just happened to have a room attached that was perfect for a church. And again, after growing the church to the breaking point, Chris and Bill purchased this property in 1995. They started, grew, and nurtured a family of children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Chris Randalls is survived by her six siblings, Tracy Langsley, Timothy Titcomb, Sherilyn Sullivan, Diane Sinclair, Bill Titcomb, and Brian Titcomb. Six children, Dara, married to William Flexing, and Anna, married to Matthew Fanning, Samuel and Tania, Marcus and Alexis, Ian and Ezra Randalls, plus Dawn Henry, their bonus daughter. Fifteen grandchildren, Abraham, Mariah, Mayella, Esther, Liam, Gwendolyn, Cecilia, Manasseh, Gabriel, Lily, Savannah, Jasmine, Evelyn, Aurelia, and little Juniper. And four great-grandchildren, Adler, Dylan, Yael, and Azarel. She is preceded in death by her parents, William, Richard, Kapahulia, Titcomb, Catherine Anna Warner, and her beloved husband, Pastor Bill Randalls. Chris was many things to many people. She was a cherished wife, mother, sister, aunt, grandmother, great-grandmother, and mentor. The roles and places she filled in the hearts and lives of those around her cannot be enumerated. She lived a beautiful life full of faith, love, and joy. And in all she did, she did it as unto the Lord. She was a fierce champion for truth and the gospel to everyone that knew her. And I'll just say a few words on my own about Chris Randalls. Chris was an amazing host to everyone that knew her. She'd spend hours making the best meals just for a few moments of fellowship at the table. She was a prayer warrior, always praying for friends, family, people in church, even random strangers she met at the grocery store and gave a word in season and said, follow Jesus. Every time she saw one of the young adults who'd come back from the military or from off to college, she'd remind them that she'd been praying for them specifically. And she did. In fact, I, I had a very difficult time at, in, in some of our prayer meetings at church getting all my prayers accomplished because Chris would monopolize the session. In my life, I don't know that I've ever met a husband and wife team like Chris and Bill Randalls. They work together so true, so together, so, so singular in their vision that God had for them and their family and their ministry. Chris and Bill were inseparable in life and now it, they're, they're inseparable in death. I'm certain of it. This last year and a half was rough for her. She missed her husband, she loved him. She cried many mornings, but I guarantee you she's with him right now, worshiping. They're in glory together. The work that Bill and Chris started goes on, not only between these four walls, but in the hearts of all who knew them. I tell my sons, find a wife, find a helpmeet, find a mother like Chris Randalls, who will stand by your side like she did Bill. At one point in their ministry, Bill and Chris had two children, Dara and Anna, and they were so busy 
with their ministry and with their duties and with reaching out and helping others that it appeared like they might not have any more children. But one day she and Bill were reading Psalm 127 together and they both came to the realization, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them and something clicked. And they started having children in secession and they caused a baby boom in the church. Not only did they have four young, strapping young men, but they caused the whole church, just in their little step of faith, to start having children and quadrupled the size of the church within just a matter of a few years. In fact, <laughs> Bill used to say, that's our plan for church growth. <laughs> and he, he would get up here and say, you know, if I'm going to go into battle, I don't want to have just one arrow and two arrows. I want to have a whole quiver full of arrows. And saints, those, a lot of those arrows are here in this service right now. Many of us can attest that simply walking through the church was like walking through a sea of little people. It was amazing. Being born on Independence Day, I think, caused Chris Randalls to be a little extra patriotic. This might explain how she spotted a young soldier at one of Bill's meetings in, in Hawaii when he was speaking and knew just something clicked in her and knew that that was the man for her daughter, Anna. Once when she went to the movies, her and her family and some folks from church went to see Rocky IV. And right at the end when Rocky's fighting the Russian and it, she didn't know if he was going to win or lose, she stood up and screamed in the middle of the movie, Go Rocky! <laughs> and the whole church, and the whole theater stopped in astonishment. But that was Chris, wasn't it? She said what she believed, and she, and she praised the Lord even more than she praised Rocky. She would lift up hands. Chris Randalls was also at the forefront of the homeschool movement that began in Iowa and other states in the 1980s. It was a conservative movement that continues to this day that harkens back when kids actually learned arithmetic, reading, and writing in school, and Christian morality, and not political indoctrination. A verse I heard her quote on occasion was train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart. See, Chris, Chris and Bill were different. They lived the Word of God. It wasn't just something that was written. It was something that they ordered their life. And saints, I would say, and people here, if you're saints or sinner or whatever you are, build your life on God's Word like Bill and Chris did. Build your life. And it caused all of us, caused many of us, to pull our kids out of school and teach them because we wanted them to learn math, English, writing, arithmetic. She was willing to sac a new, sacrifice a newer car, a bigger home, extra trips to the beach in Florida, to raise sons and daughters who could read, write, perform arithmetic, and stand in the face of blatant indoctrination and gaslighting by our new Orwellian school system. She truly raised young men and women who would build their lives on faith and the foundation of the Word of God. There's an aphorism that states, behind every good man is a great woman. After knowing Chris Randalls for 40 years, I believe this now more than ever. I asked Dara if Chris had one more word to give everyone, what would she say? And Dara said she would say what she's always said, serve Jesus with all your hearts. And I'm going to add something and finish strong. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter where you started. It doesn't matter what happened in the middle. Finish strong. Keep your eyes on Jesus like she did. Build your house on his foundation, and you'll make it to the end. You'll endure to the end like the Bible says. Thank you. We now are going to have a time for uh, family to share. Uh, we know that, that everybody here has stories about Chris and things that they want to share, but we ask that this time be kept for the family so that everyone has a chance, every family member has a chance to, to remember Chris. Oh, 
You know, I just uh, want to share a few words, um, a few memories that come to mind. There's so many. <sighs> she was such a wonderful, wonderful mother in person, but a few things come to mind, a um, couple of distinct episodes. Um, the first one, I remember uh, about 2017, I was um, in school and I having a difficult time for various reasons. I've, and I, I fell into a deep sleep and I was, I was thinking about my mom and I was thinking about how I missed her. I fell into a deep sleep and I had a, a really special dream and in the dream I was sitting in this beautiful sunlit room and it was very peaceful and very tranquil and my mother was there actually and I heard her say something to the effect of you were knit together in your mother's womb I knit you together in your mother's womb and I thought, you know, in the dream it was strange. She was speaking it as if she was speaking from God, but of course she is my mother. And this peace came over me. And I woke up the next morning and I felt awesome. I felt so peaceful and energized. And I called my mom and I said, Mom, you know, I had this great dream last night and you were there and you encouraged me like you always do. And she said, what was it? And I said, you know, I told her, I said, you know, I think there's a verse maybe from Psalms or Isaiah or something and where the Lord says, I knit you together in your mother's womb. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And I heard just her voice kind of gasp and like she would do so often, she got caught up in the moment. And I think tears started streaming down her face. She could always see the beauty of life. She lived in that beauty. And she said, when I asked her why she would react, responded that way, and she said, you know, Sam, I'm, right now I'm getting ready for vacation Bible school. And we're, the, the subject is, uh, the verse that we're using is that exact verse that I knit you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And she said, and we're, we're focusing on that theme of how each little child is uniquely created and designed by God the Father with his loving hands. And it was such a special moment because I knew that I saw so many spiritual things that I can't explain with my mom and dad. And um, I, I could never quite figure it out. How does this work? But that was one that was so intense because I had this dream and she was sitting there. She was quoting this verse. And somehow that, that was so deeply connected to reality and I never could explain it. You know, another memory I have, not as fond, I guess, but it was this in December. And uh, it was when the first time we took her to the emergency room and we, you know, things were starting to get bad. And I, I, I remember hearing just, her, she was in, the, in deep pain and I heard her say things like, I want my mom, I want my dad. And I, it was crushing to me, but, uh, what was incredible is in the depths of her pain, the next thing she would say is something like, Lord, you've always been so good to me. You're my strength, you're my salvation. Right there in the trenches that she was going through in visceral pain, she was true to form. Praises were overflowing out of her mouth in between the gasps, in between the spasms of pain. You know, she was the real deal. And I think she had this passion, this burning fire. Um, there was a great man named Soren Kierkegaard, and he said, purity of, 
the heart is to want one thing and one thing only. And I, my mom was as pure as the driven snow in that regard. All she wanted was communion with God. And she wanted to spread the love and awareness that she had to everyone in her path. And you know, you know, her life can't be summed up in words, certainly. I, there's so many things I, I wish that I would have urged my parents to write down everything that they ever did because it was so special. But I remember hearing my, hearing my mom talk about and others talk about being in, in China, in, in communist China in the 80s, handing out Bibles, planting churches at the point of gunpoint at times. Um, she went to, over to India and, and avoided uh, raging bulls in the streets. Mom, you planted so many seeds. And I'm one of them. So many of us in this room are a seed that she planted. Mom, your house was overflowing with love and joy and peace. Your gardens were overflowing with watermelon and cantaloupe and strawberries. <sighs> You know, the last seed that you're planting in the ground is your own body, your own self. And that's a hard pill to swallow for me, and I know for many of us. But I know they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, I've never met anyone like my mom or my dad, for that matter. They had a passion for God that I think some couldn't take. Not everyone, sometimes passion is, uh, can make people uncomfortable especially if you're more of a tepid nature and you don't have that within you. You don't have that same thing. You're not wired the same way. And I think in many respects, you know, my mom had scars too. There was pain in her life, in her childhood, in her youth. And everyone has a choice when pain and suffering comes along. What does it drive you to? What does it turn you into? Who do you become? What do you do with it? For her, it became, her life became about Christ, about love, about warmth, and about obeying God's commandment to be fruitful and multiply. She had so much life and energy, it was overflowing out of her. And I know that being the, you know, being the wife of a pastor, being a pastor, running a church, in many ways, they, they had to absorb the despair, the addiction, the broken families, the broken homes. People didn't come to my mom and dad and talk to them because they were happy, because they were doing great and they were wise and beautiful. And No, no, no. The people that came to my mom and dad were hurting and in despair. And my mom and dad were always there for them. Always, 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 to the very end. I think that left scars. I think it left trauma on them. But they turned it into this beautiful tapestry. They bore much fruit. And I know that the work, really, that they started many, many years ago is just beginning. It's just beginning. And I hope that we will all aspire to have that same purity of focus, purity of mind, love, courage, that energy that she had. Try to have, try to leave an impact on people the way that she did with love and it overflowing to the point that she emptied herself out. I think when she passed, she gave everything she had. She gave it all to us. She gave it all to us. She gave it all to you. If you're sitting here today, you're here in part because they touched you. 
because they emptied themselves out for you. They sacrificed for you. And you know, the last thing I'll say is I remember uh, the great President Teddy Roosevelt, um, he lost his, his spouse and he lost his, uh, his son, I believe it was, all within the span of about 30 hours. And there's a famous journal entry that he made where he just placed a big black X and said, the light has gone out of my life. And I, when my mom passed, I thought of that because it's such a beautiful expression. But I have to say, you know, the light hasn't gone out of my life. It hasn't gone out of our life. There's the great light of the world is Christ, and it will never go out. And it continues each day in us and through us, and I pray that we will be worthy of that high calling. Thank you. Hello, guys. Um, I'm uh, Matt and Anna's oldest son, Manasseh. One thing I've heard a lot was when she passed was how much of an impact my grandma had on everyone's lives. She planted a bunch of seeds in us and even planted and helped them grow, I would say. And I don't really think you can talk about uh, Chris without my grandpa, Pastor Bill. They were inseparable. They went on trips together. They took me and my brother and my uncle Ian down to Florida, me and my brother and my cousin Liam went down to Arizona to see her. But I think one thing that was so impressive about them was their, the creation, the help them of uh, planting this church. I mean, I would say this is one of their ways to um, help them keep that seed planted. Like they've start, they helped started this church and it's gonna, even with their passing, it still impacts people and just a huge turnout. But even their devotion to Christ, it was like no other. They, I mean, any time, I mean, any conversation would be like incorporate Christ, prayer, anything. <laughs> and their devotion to each other was amazing. They loved each other so much. And, it was amazing to watch them and yeah, but the last thing I'm gonna say is when I heard she was passing and saw her, I think there was only one reason. I think that she was happy to leave knowing that she had got to be with her entire family and meet her latest granddaughter, Junie. I think that was the one thing she was holding on for. And after that, she was satisfied and that one tear was that rolled down her face was, I think, a tear of joy and happiness as she got to be with her, her Lord and Savior and her husband. Thank you, guys. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get up here today, but um, I'm Dara, her oldest daughter, and uh, she lived an amazing life. So I want to honor the life that she gave all of us and her life. Um, since I'm the oldest, I've kind of known her the longest. Um, she decided as a 19-year-old to give me life. She was a very strong, independent individual. And we saw that right up until the day that she passed from this life to her heavenly home. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things about her influence and her impact on my life. Um, Jamie had talked about how she had Anna and I, and they were busy as a young couple, 
managing all the affairs of church and doing just what they love to do and very passionate about it. They both had a, a passion and a force that sometimes was like way above my head. And <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, we're just caught up in this all the time. I was talking to Anna about it the other day. I was like, we've really just had a life with just people in it all the time. Like maybe even perfect strangers, you know, they just welcomed everyone in and made a place for them and as Samuel was saying just like heard the heartbreak of people shared alongside of people on their suffering I mean I remember when we lived in that apartment people banging on the door in the middle of the night needing help and uh, that does something to you it makes you realize like why you're here you know you're here because of a greater purpose. You're here because of a greater cause. People need Jesus, and that was what they were all about. But then she decided to have four little boys all in a row, and that was a true gift to me and Anna. Whether, you know, we saw it at the time, just seeing how she raised them, how she nurtured and cared for them, I got to see this woman just give her all to church all day and then her all to her boys and birthing them and nurturing them and breastfeeding them in bed and me alongside of her. It was just, that was a huge impact for me. It really um, gave me the ability to do that seamlessly with my own children. I didn't feel lost. I felt like very equipped very taught how to mother my own children. And that was a huge gift from her. Especially since I'm a midwife and I see so many young moms who really haven't had that example, really have no idea how to um, mother. And I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying I feel particularly blessed that I had such a wonderful example in her. Um, and then a few dot thoughts about just the end of her life here. Again, just she, I, I believe she died the way she wanted to um, with her family all around her. And the, the last night we had with her where she was fully awake and fully aware, she told us that uh, she was hungry and she just got this light in her eyes and she decided she wanted a piece of toast and she asked Jasmine, she said, Jasmine, what kind of bread do we have? And Jasmine said, we have sourdough, Grandma. And she gave Jasmine a high five. <laughs> and so we're just scrambling around, you know, and she said, I want coffee too, so hurry up. <laughs> uh, we went into the kitchen and scurried, got, brought it back and that independence, she wanted that hot cup of coffee. She wanted to hold it herself. Matt made a full cup of coffee, and we're both kind of like, here, Mom. And I'm like sheltering it with my hands, and Matt's cupping it underneath of his hand. And, and then she just looks at me, and she goes, this is hard. And I could tell. <laughs> She was laying it down. She was choosing to let go. And that was hard to see. But I'm so thankful that we got to share in those last moments of her life and just, it was a gift again, just to be with her, be by her side. and usher her safely home. And I can't thank my siblings enough for fighting for her to come back home so that we could do that. And I love you all. And thank you, Mama. We love you. I think most of you know me. I'm her eldest grandson, Abraham. I just 
wanted to share. Uh, I'll never forget it. She never bought me a birthday present to open up uh, on my birthday. <laughs> she, would, she would take us and take us to the store. And I'd get to buy a Bionicles or Legos or the new Madden. I'll never forget that. <laughs> I just, me, me and her, we had our differences when I was a young man. And I think that's probably because I'm from her blood. <laughs> but I've, I've always loved her, and I'm going to miss her a lot. <sighs> Thank everyone for coming. Well, I'm one of their, uh, I've been one of the heartbreakers. <laughs> I met them when I was just a little girl <laughs> in the big brown house. We connected right away. My very first memory of a mama was of her. We were dancing in the aisle <laughs> together, singing. They accepted me when they didn't have to. You all loved me when you didn't have to. And I was angry at God for taking Papa Bear. I was like, what are you thinking? You're taking him from us. He has more work to do. I never imagined life without either one of them or any of you guys. My thought was, what are we going to do now? <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> what am I going to do? Who am I going to talk to? Because trust, I am very hard to trust on people. Because I'm one of the damaged people. <laughs> but God makes the beauty out of damage. And they, they showed me beauty. Every time when I talked to them, they prayed for me. They may be gone, but they're still, their prayers are still being answered. I'm still here. Because of them, I'm still alive. Because of them. Because of their prayers and their love. My thought was, what, am we, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> well, I had an answer on the way down. It's almost like they were talking to me. They've been loving me. God's been loving me through them. And through all of you guys. And on the way down, there was a really bad thunderstorm. I don't know if you all had that, but I couldn't see in front of the car. I was about an hour and a half away. So I had to stop. And it's at a quick strip, a quick trip. And when I went, when I stopped, I said, I texted Anna and Dara. I said, can you guys pray for me? I went in to go use the, the bathroom. I come out and the rain was gone. It was almost like it wasn't even there. I was like, what? I went in completely soaked and I come out dry. And I sat in my car, and I'm like, what is this? And all of a sudden, all the songs that came on the radio that I probably heard a million times, some of them I've never heard, and it was like, God was telling me, Donnie, I'm here. I've been here the whole time. Take me. Hold on to me. I guess that's what I got to do now. And that's what I'm going to choose. And I love you. We love you. Thank you guys for having me a part of your lives. Thank you.
I think that both Bill and Chris would want us to remember Christ through them. It was Christ who worked through their lives. It was Christ who worked through their family. It was Christ that worked through them when he told them to have more children and to keep growing as a family and to encouraging other people. And like some of the other family members were talking about, whenever you asked, I mean, you didn't even need to ask Bill and Chris to pray for you because you knew they were already praying for you. You knew it in your heart. You didn't even, when you saw them, they knew they were in constant prayer. They were constantly going before the throne of grace. They were constantly going before God. And I think they would want us to do the same. And that should be what we remember, is that they always went before God. And they weren't perfect. You know, they, they had their own issues and mistakes, and so do we. But I think they would want us to approach the throne of grace with humility and love. And I think that's just, those are my best memories of Chris, that she just was always humbly approaching God. And even in death, she laid her own life down and knew that she was going to be with the Lord. Well, I'm running out of Kleenex. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> I'm going to deeply miss Chris and Bill. They were very um, formative in my life as a Christian and as a man and as a husband and as a father. And I haven't always been the best at any of those things. Um, but they taught me something that um, was extremely important. I got saved sh shortly before I met them. And um, they taught me something I think that all of us could live by and learn from them is um, you know, how to listen to the Holy Spirit, how to listen to God. And Dawn did a great example of, you know, it's like that's what we're here on earth for. That's what this life is about, is to walk with Christ, to hear from him. And um, they taught me that. They taught me how to communicate with God, how to listen to God, how to hear from God all on my own, how to follow him and not follow anyone else. And um, that can sometimes bring us into conflict with one another. You know, because this earth, we don't really see fully. We don't see God clearly. We don't always understand. And sometimes what God is telling one person, he's maybe telling somebody else something different. And they seem to conflict, but God sees all and knows all. That's something they taught me too, you know, to, to rely on him. And that together we encourage one another to walk and listen to him, follow after him. Um, the verse kept coming to me. Uh, as Chris was lying on her deathbed. And, and it was confirmed later because I told this to someone, I don't remember who, and they said that she actually said this to them as she was on her deathbed. And that was the verse, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Okay, so while we're here on earth, to live is Christ, to encourage one another to live in Christ, with Christ, to make peace, to be peacemakers, you know, it's hard. We're human. We're not the best peacemakers, obviously. We, f we screw a lot of stuff up. But Christ urged us to be like him, to be unearthly and not worldly, but to be like him, to be heavenly, to think of heavenly things, to think of the spirit, which is pure, and brings us together. Despite our differences, we can find peace with one another. I think that, you know, Chris has found peace the kind of peace we can't even really imagine here on this earth. But to live is Christ. To die is gain. And the spirit dwells within it all. From the time we were knit in our wombs, like Samuel said. You know, he knit us in the womb to please him, to glorify him, and to serve him in peace and in the spirit, to walk in the spirit. So I would say that's the one thing that I really feel blessed that I've received, um, that they really gave me a very good education. I know many of us here um, were part of that, of them educating us in the ways of the Lord, in the how to walk in the spirit. And then they didn't just educate us, they lived it by example. 
And again, nobody's perfect. That doesn't really matter. God's perfect. And he makes us to become more and more perfect as we walk throughout our lives. Um, to finish strong is good. I think a good life and a strong finish is valuable. You know, it's, there is no, that's the only value. You can't put a, you can't put a price on that. That's eternal. You know, through the generations, how many knows how many generations we won't even get to, many of us here in this room won't see the end of the work that Chris did with her life. And I think she would encourage us all to do the same with our lives. And, um, you know, God is a timeless being. He doesn't really consider time. He considers quality, you know. He can do more in our lives in a half an hour than we could do in multiple lifetimes under our own strength. What we think we're doing or what we think we've wasted, God can redeem. He's, it's all redeemable. And so um, I would just say that, you know, walk in the Holy Spirit, listen to him. Spend time in prayer like they, like Bill and Chris both did. Like Chris always told me she was praying for me. And I knew too, just like Liam said, we can all, I knew that she was praying for me. Um, she was always, me, she was always, <sighs> met me with a kiss, you know, and an embrace. And uh, I loved her like a mother. She was a mother to me. And Bill was a father. Um, I had a deep love for her in that sense, and I knew that she reciprocated that. <laughs> and um, I just want to say thank you, Chris, for what you've given to all of us here. <laughs> You'll be missed, and your love will shine in our hearts because it's not a love that even came from her. She just let the love of the Lord flow right through her. <laughs> I'm going to miss her. And um, I can always speak for everyone here that um, we know you're in a better place, and we're glad. We're glad that you lived your life for Christ and that now you've gained Christ. And uh, we are all excited to meet you there someday and join you. And that's what our life is for. You know, this world is fading away, but the kingdom of heaven will last forever and ever. And it's a beautiful place, and it lives in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and that's what's important. So I encourage anyone here that hasn't received the Holy Spirit or hasn't received Christ into their life, if you learn nothing else from this funeral, I know Chris would say, do that, because that makes your life worth living, and it's all worthwhile. So, amen. I'm Mariah, I'm the oldest granddaughter. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a few words about Non, and I, I didn't think I would speak, but I'm just hearing everyone reminisce over her, and um, it's making me think of Proverbs 31. Um, I think a, a big part of her legacy was being a strong matriarch, and showing to us women what it means to be a woman. Um, her femininity was very strong and it's, yeah, like my mom was saying, just taught us how to be a woman and a wife and a mother just through the way she lived and her, her leading by example. Um, I think particularly verses 31, or sorry, 26 and 27. She opened her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. And then 28, her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. I think. Um, if that's anything that I take away from Non's life, 
It was um, how great of a wife she was to my grandpa, Bill. She really was his crown. And he found treasure in her, like rubies, like this proverb says. And um, I just hope that to the end with my husband, that I have that with him, that we, that people see that glow, that we are so in love, like they were. And that that impacts their great grandchildren still and will. I think that legacy will never die. That legacy will live on. And um, it's beautiful to think about and reflect on, especially being a married person now and being a mother. Um, So much that I can take from her example through even Anna and my mom. Like she lives on through them um, by example. So I will forever be grateful for that. And yeah, love you, Nan. Hi. Um. <laughs> My name's Mayla. I'm sure many of you um, know me. I just wanted to say that I am one of the many people who is here because of Chris and my son, Azriel, is here because of Chris. Um, And I was thinking on her life and how she passed before any of her children or her grandchildren or her great-grandchildren passed. And I thought to myself that that would be a blessed life to live if I were to pass before any of my children or my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren. And God blessed her life with many, many children. And she loved them all so much. And she got to meet Azrael and Junie um, a few days before she passed. And I was so happy that she got to meet them. But I don't think I was nearly as happy as she was to meet them. So um, I just, I will miss her. Come on, that few Nani. Hello, my, my name is Jordan. I'm uh, Mayla's husband, and I've had the privilege to know Chris for a couple of years. And not only has she welcomed me without even a thought, like as soon as Mayla and I got married, she uh, treated me like her own grandchild. Right, right away. I do believe that she had a more profound impact on me than um, I thought I'd ever ask for. As, uh, as some of you may know, my mother's terminal, and we invited her over here, this home, for lunch uh, one day. And uh, for a couple of years now, my mom felt pretty lonely, um, even though you know she was surrounded by family. But she told me that uh, having lunch with Chris and just spending time together, there was a profound sense of solidarity there to just sit across from somebody, not only who loves God as well, but to sit across with somebody who understands at such a deep level. And, and Chris gave my mom some comfort as somebody who understood her position really well. And, Uh, I was really encouraged by that and to encourage you all that even though she was in her state at the time this was only not uh, a year ago barely even in her state that she she kept working for the Lord she kept she kept going she kept going and um, even though I've only known her a couple years uh, just that consistency is something I desire to see in all of us as well And, and 
and encouraged my mom to keep to keep going running the race till the end too, which is the theme I've been kind of sensing here. So even even though she only knew my mom for five minutes, Chris seems to be the kind of person where you only need five minutes to become a friend. I'll just say real quickly, if, <laughs> I don't want to cut anybody off, so if there's anybody that still wants to say anything, it's your last chance, because once I get rolling, I can talk a little bit, so, but, but if there's nobody else that would, okay, um, one thing that, just sitting here thinking about, like Jamie alluded to, you know, many people have said they wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Chris. <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> you know, as like says Jimmy said, many of you know the story, but for those that don't, I give you the very abbreviated version of a very long story that I was stationed in Hawaii. Bill and Chris were there doing a conference, and um, I'd been doing some some work and been on duty and hadn't slept in about 36 hours. And I was at this conference with some friends, and afterwards they said, we, we've got to ask this Pastor Bill some questions. And I said, guys, we're coming back tomorrow. I want to go home and go to sleep. I haven't slept. And they said, no, no, you'll, you'll be OK. Just wait. And so in true fashion of mine, stewing over in the corner because I didn't get my way and I should have known to be at a place like that acting upset you might as well put a neon sign above your head that says I need someone to help me and I'll never remember Chris come over and talk to me she had no idea why I was upset no idea why I was sitting by myself brooding but you saw somebody who just needed somebody to talk to and she'd do anything she could to help and like I said that's the short version of a very long story of why I'm here because she was always bold she never held back in anything and I rem that was the first time she ever talked to me and I'll tell you about the last time she said anything to me it was as Dara said, we were all sitting in the living room with her and she kind of perked up and said she was hungry and then, which is kind of true to our relationship. I teased her a little bit about what to eat and I remember she looked at me straight in my eyes and she, she says, Marcus, go get my gun. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably a microcosm of how we were too. <laughs> and then, and I know there's many people here who can share many stories about times that they've had with her and, and memories. And in, and in one way, um, my job's a little bit one of the easiest here. Because I know, in a sense, what I have to say. And, and I've said this to many times, many people. I said, when I get to heaven, there's many things that I'll have to answer for. There's many things that God's going to question me on, and why I did things the way that I did, and why I said what I said, why I thought what I thought. But there's one thing that I'll never answer for. And I want to make sure, because probably the thing that scares me the most is if I speak at Chris's funeral and don't give the gospel. And I know you heard it in many ways already today. In the fact that how Chris lived her life, the boldness she had, the impact that she had on people. And I remember one thing she always said. The truth matters. Truth matters. Now I want to read you a passage shortly. 
John 14 says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus says. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may also be. <laughs> and you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Like I said, I know there's many people who got many, many memories of Chris. And many things that you could share. Joy, pain, sorrow, happiness, and all the gambit of human emotions. But one thing Chris was always about was the truth. And I think many times when she would say that to me, truth matters. <laughs> I didn't fully grasp. And I thought about that after she passed, truth matters. And I think what she was really saying, in a way, was that Christ matters. Christ said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Now we live in a world that will give you all kinds of ways to look righteous and to look good and to check the boxes that society wants you to check. And this world can tell you all different kinds of lies at the same time. But there's one that will never lie to you. There's one who will never deceive you. And that's Christ Jesus. Now you've heard many say here that we can't wait till we get to see Chris again. Can't wait till we get to see Bill again. We can't wait till we get to see our God again in heaven. Till we finish our race. But I want to be very clear, be very short, but very clear. There's only one way that you'll ever get to spend eternity with Christ and Chris and Bill. And that's if you recognize, just like we have, look, like I said, I've made many mistakes in my life, done many things wrong, done, said, thought many things I regret <laughs> that I did. But in a way, we're all the same. We all at one time were separated from God because of the sin that was in our life. And in that sin is nothing but death. You can try to do so many things in your life, in your own power, in your own way, in the way the world tells you that you should live. That road leads to destruction. That road leads to an eternal death. But there's also a road that leads to life, that leads to eternity, that leads to Christ, that leads to heaven. And many people have asked, what's heaven going to be like? Well, I'll tell you, we can't describe heaven, only other than to tell you what it's not. Heaven is so great. The only way we can describe it is to say that there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more sickness. And no more death. All the things that make this world crummy. 
all the things that make us not want to be here anymore. In heaven, there's none of that. No more pain. No more sorrow. And no more death. How do you get that? How do you make sure you're on that road? How do you turn your back on this world and say, I reject death and I want life? So many times that first step is the hardest. Because what you have to do is you have to humble yourself. You have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to admit that you've shaken your fist at God and told him, no, God, not your way, but my way. And understand, all, eternity, all this time here on earth basically comes down to two points in eternity. First was in the first garden, in the Garden of Eden, where Adam said, no, God, not your will, my will will be done. And he took from that apple and plunged all of humanity into sin. And the second time, in the second garden of Gethsemane, when Christ on his knees praying to his Father in heaven, said, Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. We pray the same thing in our lives when we repent of our sins. Lord, not my will will be done anymore, but Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. Come into my heart. Cleanse me from my sin. Wash me white as snow. You understand, that's a miracle. The fact that anybody's saved is a miracle. You can't take a dirty garment, plunge it into blood, and pull it out, and it's white as snow. The world doesn't work that way. But no, that's how God works. He can take everything nasty in your life, every bad thing you've ever said, done, thought, and he can plunge that life into the blood of his son and pull it out in its white as snow. It's the first step. He can wash you clean. Then you really know the same thing that Chris did and would say over and over again, Truth matters. Truth matters. And that's the truth. Christians don't grieve the way the world grieves. We don't feel sorrow the way the lost feel sorrow. Yes, we're sad. Yes, we wish we had more time with Chris. But at the same time, we're happy. We have joy. Because we know that she finished her race. And right now, she's, <laughs> she's more happy, more joyous than she's ever been. Praising God, man, the woman could praise God. And now she's doing it even greater than she ever did here in the throne room with hands raised. Sure, God gave her a guitar. <laughs> but as we finish up here and we move from here to the gravesite, I want you to remember one thing. So many times in these situations, we're so caught up in the, the, everything that needs to happen, everywhere we need to be. But the time will come. Maybe tonight, maybe in the future. Maybe when you're driving from here, I don't know. But you'll replay everything that's said here today. Don't brush that away. Don't dismiss it as a bunch of godly gobbledygook that a bunch of deceived people. Think about it. Meditate on it. Think of the things that were said, and I want you to do one thing. If you're not a believer, you're not sure, you don't know what to do, I want you to ask God for wisdom. Just truly say, God, show me the truth. 
Because he promises us, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask and I will freely give it to you. And I don't, I don't doubt that one bit. If you're not sure, you don't know, you don't understand, just ask God to show you. And I believe my God when he says something, he's going to do it. And he will show you the way. He will show you the truth. Put your trust in him. Don't trust in this world. Don't trust in your bank account. Don't trust in your 401k or your job. That all be taken from you. But one thing that will never be taken from you, nobody can ever take from you, is who you are in Christ, and who Christ says you are. No matter what happens in this world, nobody can ever take that from you. So yeah, I'm one of those. If it wasn't for Chris, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Some poor teenage kid feeling sorry for himself in the corner. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if she knew how it would all play out if she'd just stay where she was at. <laughs> but. But you know what? If Chris thought, and I'm sure she did, and she knew that she had to go through all of this, she had to come talk to me, she had to come talk to you, she had to do whatever it would be, so that it would come to this one point right now that somebody might hear the gospel. She'd do it all again. Yeah. And she'd do it the same way. That's what she was about. That's what honored. That's who she honored. We come here today to remember her and honor her, but she honored God, and the whole time you'd say anything nice to her, she'd point to her Savior. Honor Him. Honor Him. And I do want to thank you all for coming here today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the time that we had with our dear sister. God, I'm sure that she would echo exactly and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Let nothing be seen in me that appears to be of myself, but God, only let your light shine. We. Uh, we have a graveside service next, and then there will be a, a small lunch afterwards here for anybody who can attend. Uh, if you all would please join me in the Lord's Prayer. We'd like to say that together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.